Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Terry Mottishead. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law, and I am absolutely delighted to be able to act as your host for the amazing Ab Saraswat, who is going to chat with us today about chat GPT plugins and a whole bunch of other stuff. If you haven't had the opportunity to meet Ab yet, why not? He's, a, he's an amazing. So, uh, but a quick intro of him. He's the Chief Revenue Officer at Lupal, which for those of you who are not familiar with Lupal, they're a legal project management and task management outfit, but he's also the founder of Fringe Legal. And um, Ab describes that as his passion project, but it's a uh, it's an amazing information uh, and connection point for lots of people in this uh, in this industry and interested in this bit of what's happening in the legal sector. Um, he has a podcast. He also has a newsletter and a bunch of other really exciting projects coming up um, through that as well. Ab, welcome again. I know that you're in LA and it's a little later in the afternoon for you, but it's wonderful to have you here. And um, now over to you. Thanks, Terry, and uh, thank you for having me. Hello, everyone, and uh, excited to be here to talk to you in the second session of the series about, in this case, about ChatGPT plugins. Um, so here is a roadmap of what we're going to be covering today. Um, and as Terry mentioned, please, please, please make sure to put in questions. We'll try and add some interactivity throughout the session. So I would love participation as we go through. Uh, and those of you that may be listening to this, um, I'll try and um, provide as much context, but make sure to check out the video when you get the chance. Um, so thank you, Terry, for that kind of introduction. Uh, really, the key things that we're going to cover today is just a little bit of recap on why you should care about ChatGPT and plugins itself. We'll give an overview into the difference between APIs and, and plugins. And then for the majority of the session, we'll focus on plugins, including going into ChatGPT. Uh, and I hope to show you a couple of different ways in how uh, certainly I'm using plugins and some other individuals I've spoken to within the legal profession are leveraging plugins. Um, and then we'll wrap things up with looking at what's ahead, what does the future hold? Um, surprise, surprise, I have no idea. Well, I'll certainly conjecture and give you a couple of suggestions of my own, and they'll link back to the APIs and plugins debate itself. So I won't go through and give you a full history of um, why you should care about AI how we got to this point. If you're interested in that, make sure you check out the session that Karen and Mitchell did last week. Uh, it was absolutely amazing and there's certainly a recording of that available. Um, but it is worth noting that we're relatively early on when it comes to this. Um, so you may have seen this meme before. And this essentially exemplifies the state of being for generative AI. So the black circle, the biggest volume is all the people talking about AI and generative AI to be specific. The purple is people who are actually using the tools. So think ChatGPT, Bard, and other tools like that. And uh, then it gets smaller still about those, uh, for those individuals leveraging these tools as part of their organizational strategy. And lastly, those individuals who are actively leveraging these tools to add value and create value in their firms and organizations. So I'm curious as I continue going through, if the people who are watching this live, if you could put in the, either the chat um, or in the, in, in the Q&A section, which part of the circle you're on, uh, no judgments whatsoever, but I'm just really curious on where people stand. Uh, so outside all the way in. Um, and the purpose of this is while there is a lot of chatter about ChatGPT, it's still really early. So if you think about the technological wave, um, we are right, right behind it. We're not riding the wave quite yet. And we're certainly not underneath it as it crashes upon us. Um, so keep that in mind as you listen to me and other individuals as well, right? The experts are still to be found in the space and there is a lot of potential, a lot of learning that we have to do together. Uh, and by the way, as I go through these, many of these graphics, this one included, these are created by generative AI. I wanted to put um, the, uh, the tools in practice. The other thing that we should think about is what you may recognize as the crossing the chasm diagram. 
that this diagram um, is made popular by Jeffrey Moore in his book, Cross the Chasm. And we're very much in the early market. For all of you listening, I would think quite comfortably fit in this innovator segment. Uh, we're super early on where you know, we are looking to review new things and we will become the early adopters, the visionaries about setting the path for what's to come later on. As we move into the mainstream market, getting those solutions that are reliable, consistent, and convenient, uh, we get into the mainstream market. And this is where the most of the value creation happens. Uh, so again, for me, this is important because A, it keeps me in check in terms of what I know and what the learnings are available. Um, and also it helps to just set the stage for how much more we can share with each other and uh, the community on what's working, what can be improved, um, and just keeping up with the rapid pace of development. Um, with regards to chat GPT itself, um, I think the next two slides before we dive and start, start diving into the plugins or three slides um, exemplify why everyone's talking about it. Uh, so if you think about the classic two by two matrix of easy accessibility and what the tool does, chat GPT is functional and easy. It hits the, you know, it hits the mark on making it available for as many people as possible. Hence why you see all the stats about how quickly it got to the first hundred million users. Um, but easy doesn't mean that it's something that people want to keep using. There's still a learning curve. There's still an adoption curve. And that's one of the ideas behind plugins. How can we expand the ecosystem so it becomes useful for the task that you want to do every single day? Um, and lastly, you should care because uh, studies like this, and there's plenty of them, show the potential and the benefit of leveraging ChatGPT and other large language models, um, which allow you to ex uh, exponentially increase your pace of learning. Uh, so with this chart, it's showing that leveraging AI tools and the assistance of AI tool, the onboarding that would take normally six months can happen in two months. It's a massive, massive difference, not just for yourself as you're trying to learn and um, get on board with, um, become comfortable with new tools and technologies and processes, but anyone else that you're adding to your team. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen this adage before and you can replace legal professional with any title, but the goal being that legal professionals aren't going to be replaced by AI. They'll be replaced by other individuals using AI tools. Um, so for you, my ask is think about your role, what you do on a day by day, week by week basis. What are tasks that you think can be done by the large language model? What if there was one part of your role that you could leverage chat GPT for as your sidekick? And some of the things I'll show you today may help provide a bit of hint and guidance to that. Um, and this is more to say that it's not there to replace junior lawyers or to replace whatever your role is in the firm, um, but it may help you focus on things that add more value. And hopefully you can get rid of some of that monotonous work, some of those things that can be automated. I've certainly done that um, and I'm happy to share um, ideas around how and what I've been able to accomplish. So let's dive into the meat of it. So let's first talk about, before we get into plugins, why plugins matter and what's the difference between plugins and APIs. Uh, so you may have heard the term APIs, you certainly have heard the term apps, and you'll be hearing a lot more about plugins today. So here's the key difference. On the left, the APIs and the apps, they're generally, the APIs are much more technical. They're the prog programmatic way that you interact with any technology. So APIs aren't specific to large language models. They're not specific to open AI. They apply to technology generally. It's how you interact with a system uh, and they help facilitate the communication. They're that messenger layer between the user and other systems, right? And that means that they need to be built um, by generally technical individuals uh, or armchair technical individuals like myself sometimes uh, to interact with the tools. 
plugins, on the other hand, and we are all familiar with plugins, uh, because if you use a browser and have plugins or extensions involved, uh, you'll know that if you're using Word or Excel and are using add-ins, they work in a very similar way. They extend the capability of the program that they sit on top of. So in Chrome, you may have a, um, a add-in to help you save passwords or to manage your bookmarks better. In Word, you may have add-ins to run comparisons and so on. What they do is they add or improve the experience. And not always, but most, most of the time, plugins are a way to show the user a bit more, uh, certainly from an output perspective, than you might have from an API. And apps are all plugins and APIs bundled together a lot of the time, they're the full package. So thinking about plugins now, um, there's really three things I'm going to cover. First is a bit more around things that you should be mindful of. I'm going to give the disclaimer of all the things that can potentially go wrong. Um, second, we'll actually go in and uh, go into chat GPT and leverage the plugins. And I'll also give you some tips before we're talking about the future. So when it comes to plugin, the first thing to bear in mind is at the moment, plugins uh, in the context of large language models are available only for ChatGPT plus subscribers. Um, they will be coming to Microsoft Bing in the future, um, but we'll cover that in a bit more detail. But first, um, really, why do plugins exist for ChatGPT? There was a flurry of, um, flurry of excitement when plugins were first announced and introduced. And the biggest reason for that was the large language model, as large and sophisticated as they are, they are limited in what they can do by themselves. So there needed to be a way to expand beyond that, to be able to access real-time information, to be able to connect to what's happening in the world, to update um, with context at GPT with what is the latest, because as you might know, at GPT, the training data stops at 2021, September 2021. So if you wanted to get information that's a bit more relevant and current, you needed a way to be able to do that. Um, plugins also allow you to connect to other knowledge-based systems, things PDF, documents, and other repositories, and to really add a, a level of complexity beyond what is possible by default in ChatGPT. And we'll go into some of these examples. Before we do that, um, this is probably the most important slide to bear in mind. Um, before you use plugins, and indeed before you use ChatGPT, make sure you're aware of these items. So data and uh, data security and privacy, number one. Make sure you know um, and you know what you're putting into the system. All of the data I'm going to put in uh, either is fictitious or publicly available. Um, please don't put anything sensitive. Um, I heard someone talk about it as the Reddit test. Um, if it's something that you wouldn't post on Twitter or Reddit, uh, then don't put it in ChatGPT. Um, be still be mindful of reliability and accuracy of the results. Um, generative AI uh, is probably the best liar that you'll ever meet. Uh, so double check the information, make sure that it's factual, it's accurate, uh, and it's fit for purpose. And then specific to plugins, uh, there's, also, there's always a platform risk. Uh, so actually there's a broader platform risk when it comes to ChatGPT. Uh, if you're building something on top of it, what if ChatGPT uh, or OpenAI stops providing that service? What do you do? Uh, similarly for plugins, if you become too reliant on a plugin, um, what if it's a one person team that's developed that plugin? What if they can no longer support it? Uh, and by the way, there are some amazing single and solo um, founders and creators. Um, so nothing against them, but it's something that you have to bear in mind. What happens if you're not able to support uh, the functions that you're used to using these plugins. Do you know enough about how they work so you can figure out an alternative um, way to get to the results that you're used to? All right, so how do we get started? Uh, there's three steps. Number one, as I mentioned, plugins are only available to ChatGPT plus users. Um, so just bear that in mind. It costs $20 a month uh, to have access to ChatGPT plus, uh, and you do need that in order to leverage the plugins. Then you activate your plugins and then you select the plugins. There's a couple of slides about how you do that. And we'll come to that in a second. 
um, and then in fact, we'll come back to the tips to enhance your experience and more after that. All right, um, so here we are in ChatGPT. Uh, the first thing, assuming you have ChatGPT Plus, and you'll know you have Plus because every time you open it, you'll see this nice little screen. Uh, the first thing you want to do is make sure you have access to plugins. Um, so one way to make sure that you do that is go into your settings. So right in the bottom, you can click on settings. And in the beta features, you have the ability to turn these things on and off. So if you've had ChatGPT4 and you can't see plugins, um, this is likely why. They started rolling it out a few, I think two months ago now, but most people should have access to them. So make sure that if you want browser, with Bing is available uh, and plugins are available too. That's step one. Step two is you need to leverage GPT-4. So as a rule of thumb, GPT-3 is um, really good at most things. Uh, it's really useful for problem solving when you want to be able to help come up with an answer that's already been solved. So think of things like programming, uh, being able to give things uh, as an output to a very simple, straightforward question. GPT-4 is great when it comes to logic and reasoning. That's the big advantage of this model, uh, of course, as well as the ability to do these other things. So once you've selected GPT-4, you have the ability to select either browse with Bing. Uh, this allows you to provide links and basically for a GPT to go out into the world and search the web for you. I'm gonna suggest a different way to do that, which, uh, which gives you better results. And that's through using plugins. So if I select plugins, we now have, in fact, when you select it for the first time, you'll likely see something like this, no plugins are enabled. Um, you won't see anything here except for the ability to go to the plugin store. So it gives you some warnings, that's fine. Um, and then you'll be able to access the plugins from the store. Um, now, it's important to know that A, the plugin store is constantly evolving. Uh, if I go into all plugins, you'll see there are now 72 pages um, of plugins available. There is a lot. Um, and by the way, this is one of the downsides at the moment of the GPT plugin store. Um, it is quite a, a, quite a nuisance to navigate actually. So unless you know what you're searching for, um, it's difficult to figure out what you want and you can search for things. So it works. So if you're looking for a plugin that helps with PDF, you can search for that. You can see three pages of results. Good. Um, the couple of plugins I'll walk you through and all of them work in the same way. So um, the plugin that we're going to, the three plugins we're going to use today is a plugin called WebPilot, which has this blue logo to it. And uh, this allows you um, to be able to browse the web and get results back. Um, my, in my testing and experimentation, uh, this has given me better results than browse with Bing as, a, um, as an alternative. That's the first plugin. The other one we're going to leverage is called Prompt Perfect. The Prompt Perfect is here. It's also one of the most popular plugins used. Uh, and I spoke about um, supporting indie creators and developers. This is actually created by one individual. I think they yeah, have a company now supporting it. Um, it's been used to um, used by over a hundred thousand users, I believe, um, at this point. Um, and it's a non-technical individual who used ChatGPT to create this plugin. Um, really interesting guy. Uh, so that's the other one, Prompt Perfect. We'll also be using a plugin called Show Me Diagrams, um, which has a sort of diagrammatic look to it. And all you need to do to install the plugin is click on the install button. It will download it and install it on the browser itself. So you're not actually downloading anything to your system. You'll then have a list of plugins that you have available to play around with. Now, my first tip is before you start chatting with GPT, select the plugins that you want to use. Once you start the chat, you cannot go back and select the plugin for that chat. It's fine, you can just start a new chat, but just be mindful of that. Um, second tip is you can select up to three plugins at a time. So if I select, and it will tell you, if I select three plugins and try and do the fourth, it says three or three enabled. So that's absolutely fine. Um, 
we'll start with one plugin at a time, and then we'll go and explore further. In fact, we'll start with the Show Me Diagrams plugin, and we'll go further from there. So once you've selected the plugin, um, one of the things that you can actually, if you don't know what a plugin is, one of the things that you can actually do is ask GPT, what are the capabilities of this plugin? And if you do that, it will actually go back um, and it will look through um, the, the plugins repository, the instructions, and give you the answers from there. One of the things to bear in mind, uh, this is the downside of plugins. By using a plugin, because one of the questions that comes up a lot, why wouldn't I just have my three plugins I use all the time selected by default? One of the reasons for that is what you're seeing on the screen. By leveraging plugins, uh, GPT gets very, very slow. Um, and the reason for this is anytime you give it instructions, it needs to go into its database, find that plugin, get the answers, and then pass that back to the user. And sometimes it will not work. Um, and that may be the case here. And you can just refresh it. Usually it's perfectly fine. Um, so we'll give it a second uh, as that happens. And while we do that, um, there you go, network error. Um, we'll try again, there we go. Um, so whilst it, whilst it does that, um, I'll give you the, the quick version of what this plugin does and why I chose to use this today. Um, so show me is a really interesting plugin that can help create visualizations and diagrams specifically. Um, so um, it's a really different way of trying to ingest and understand information uh, that you can, you can use for different purposes. So if we use a couple of uh, examples, so we've been talking about ChatGPT, so maybe one of the things that we can do, and by the way, to invoke a plugin, there's two ways to do that. Um, either if you have the plugin available, you can use its name. So in this case, show me, or you can, if you have multiple plugins to help the large language model, you can be specific. So you can say, use the show me plugin um, to create a detailed diagram and so on. Um, so when we do that, we'll see what happens. So in this case, I've asked the plugin to explain to me how chat GPT works between a user making a query and getting a response back. So essentially the process is going through right now. Um, and you'll see it goes through and it gives you, in this case, a sequence diagram. And the use case for this is a couple of things. Uh, number one, um, I can view this diagram in a new tab. I can actually use this diagram if I have a presentation or something similar. Um, I can also go and edit this diagram. Um, so I can go through and edit this diagram in a number of different ways. Uh, so I can update, I can pan and zoom, I can actually add additional nodes and so on to it. This becomes a bit more complicated, admittedly, um, but just know that capability is there. Um, and for all of you, if we get back to this tab, um, one of the other ways it's useful, and certainly one of the ways I use it is for it to explore and explain different concepts to me. So one of the things that you can do, so in the world of law, um, last year, we all heard a lot about that special purpose acquisition companies. Um, and I wanted to understand how they work. It's been a while since I came out of law school. I don't really work in this area. Um, so this is one example to do that. And in this case, I've just said, explain to me how facts work. So it's using the plugin to map out a diagram of what that looks like. We'll give it a second. And again, you can see it shows me that SPAC of you know, all of these different components to it and so on. And this diagram is, uh, is perfectly good. Um, I can go through and um, I can ask ChatGPT additional questions now about this diagram. So it has now this diagram and the plugin information in memory. So I can, I can ask it some additional questions. Um, and we might do that in a second. So if I use one more example, we can use um, we can use this to create entity diagrams as well. 
Uh, so in this case, I'll ask it to create an entity diagram for meta platforms, I think, and see what it comes up with. So for all of you listening, we now have an entity diagram that shows that Meta owned four different companies, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Oculus. Um, and we can do we can use this to uh, a lot more. So, and it tells you, by the way, um, what kind of diagram it is and some helpful hints as well. So that's the first plugin. This is called Show Me, and we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, the other plugin is called Web Pilot. Um, so again, one of the one of the limitations of GPT out of the box is that it's not connected to the internet. So the data it has available is limited by what it can do. So in this case, I'm going to select show me diagrams. I'm going to also select web pilot, and I am going to select prompt. Perfect. I'm going to select three plugins before we get started, um, and. I have this page open from OpenAI. We spoke about their structure. We're going to do some, uh, we're going to ask it some information about that. So I can ask, um, and actually I should give some context. So one of the plugins that we have selected is Prompt Perfect. Um, no doubt you would have heard a lot more about prompt engineering. How do you, how, how do you question the chat GPT to give you the best results? Um, there's a, a whole body of research and debate about the best approaches here. Um, one of these plugins, Prompt Perfect, allows you to take some of that thinking out of um, out of your hands, and it does it for you. So the way this plugin works is you can start either your sentence with perfect, and then give it your query. Uh, so I can say perfect. Uh, give me a summary of this page. And I'll give it the page, and you'll see that it will hopefully leverage WebPilot first to access the, the page. And then hopefully if it works well, um, it will then tell me a output based on this. So that's all nice and well. Um, I can actually go and ask it because there's a lot of information on this page and it's not very helpful for me to picture how things work. So I can actually go and ask it um, to build onto a previous example to give me a structure diagram. I'm going to ask it to create a diagram based on that page now. So we already reviewed what that page is, but now it's gonna go through and use that information to create a structure diagram. So this is much more complicated, as you can see. And you can see we now see that for OpenAI, they have two different key subsidiaries, one for profit uh, and one for nonprofit. Um, we can actually ask it a bit more information. So now we know that, um, provide me with a summary of Structure. And when I'm writing perfect, it's going through and it's actually converting um, a bit more information, it's converting my prompt into something a bit more expanded. And in some instances with all these plugins, if I open this, you can actually see what's happening behind the scene. So you can see that when I said, show me a diagram, it's asking for what kind of diagram and it's feeding in all of this information. It doesn't matter about the details here, um, which is then using to create this diagram for me. So my, my goal in showing all of this is you can leverage this to expand on what the output is of, um, of your prompt, right? So you can actually structure them in a different way. You can get information presented to you back in a different way. Um, they are, hundreds of plugins now, I think about 700 or so in total at this stage, and, and we'll continue adding more. Um, so one of the things that you might want to do is continue to explore additional plugins. Um, and 
Other plugins that you might want to use allow you to query things like PDFs. Again, please don't put any sensitive information into ChatGPT, but it could be that they are publicly available PDFs like research papers that you might want to get summaries for, uh, and you can use the WebPilot plugin for that. Um, one of the plugins I certainly use a lot um, is a plugin that I will show you. I think I created it here. Um, it's called Wox uh, Script. Um, so last week, uh, Terry in the Center for Innovation did the session with, with Karen uh, and by providing a link to this video, I'm able to ask the plugin to provide me with a summary of this. So it actually goes through the entire transcript um, of this video, which is over an hour long, to give me an output based on what are some of the key talking points. So again, if you are using this as a way to, uh, to reference information, that might be helpful as well. Okay. Uh, questions on plugins before I go back to my slide and I can sort of talk a bit more about and uh, the future and things to be mindful of. See something here today. Um, do plugins help reduce the issue of hallucinations? Um, to some degree, um, in some, it, it won't get rid of it completely. Uh, it's definitely a risk to be mindful of. Um, in some cases, it will help it reduce the risk of pollution, hallucinations because you're, you can point it to a specific source now. Um, so there are a couple of ways that you can help minimize the risk. Uh, so using plugins, so if I wanted to give me an overview of OpenAI and I'm pointing it to this page, instead of saying provide me with a structure of this, I can tell ChatGPT only use this link to provide me with the structure for OpenAI. Um, and second, you can actually try and set temperature controls um, as part of your prompts. And for anyone who doesn't know what temperature is, it goes from a zero to, well, technically infinity, but zero to 1.8 or two is a good scale to work with. And essentially, oops, that's not helpful, is it? Um, just sending random numbers. Um, so what's, what the temperature does, it tells the large language model chat GPT in this case, how creative you want it to be. So if I'm asking GPT a question and I say, what does open AI want to achieve in the future? Um, and I say temperature, and I'm gonna say 0 0.1, it will give me an answer. And then, I give it a temperature of two, this is finished. Um, two, 0 0.1 means that it's referencing the information it knows um, as much as possible. Um, so it will try and reference that page and it'll try and be very, very strict. If I give it a temperature of two, it's going to try and use this creative license. Um, and it may or may not give you the same results. Um, but just be mindful that you can influence other results, but always make sure that you check them. Is it possible to ask to answer a question using one source, only a regulated website, which includes PDFs? Um, so yes, it is possible to do that. Um, and you can do it in a number of different ways. So if you have papers, uh, you can absolutely you can all absolutely point ChatGPT to PDFs itself. Uh, so we might try and do that now, actually, if you don't mind. Uh, so here is a, uh, a paper I've been wondering. Let's do strictly necessary cookies. Be mindful about cookies here. Um, and if I open this PDF in the browser and we're trying to test this live, so we'll see how well it works. So this research paper is written by two lawyers um, around law firm's responsibility. Um, so one of the P one of the plugins that we can use is called Ask Your PDF. And there's a number of them, as you saw from my search earlier, you might remember, there's about three pages worth of plugins. Um, so in this case, I can say, um, provide me a summary of this paper, pulling out my key points. And in fact, I'm gonna write a better prompt act as a law firm analyst and provide me a 
and see if it works. This may fail miserably because we're doing this live, but it's worth trying. But yes, um, you can um, you can prompt it. You can see it's invoked the app, your PDF, so it recognizes a link is a PDF, um, and it might come back hopefully with a response. No, nope, there you go. So it doesn't link to a specific PDF file. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so you can either upload the PDF or if it linked to a PDF directly on a regulator side, and true in this case, it's just showing a PDF, it's not actually a link to it, uh, it might work. Um, but yes, if you had a real PDF, it might give you, it, it will likely give you an answer. I'm not going to upload a file here, um, but it is possible for sure. Ab, when you're, um, when you're asking it to create a diagram using the plugins that you've shown us, um, is there any anything gained or lost by asking for the summary first of the text that it then creates a diagram versus asking for the diagram, if you like, from the original text before it was summarised? So what, what I'm kind of asking you here is, is there a cadence in a way that would be helpful to follow if you were going from text to diagram and yeah. probably back the other way? It depends on the output that you're looking for. Uh, so if the text on the site has enough information um, that you feel is um, it's, it's going to be sufficient to create the diagram, then absolutely you can um, just point it to the site and go from there. Um, alternatively, um, it might be worth getting the in output first to get the summary, uh, if there's a lot of information on a page, for example, so if it was a list of different company structures, um, that may be one way to go where you say, you know, from this link, can you grab the structure for OpenAI? Um, and then you create use that information to prompt the diagram. And by the way, for the diagram, it's also worth noting that um, once a diagram is created, that was a fun one I did, um, you can um, ask it to amend the diagram as well. So you can prompt it to say, uh, you know, give me additional information um, and you can sort of go and give get information like that. Correct. Uh, temperature controls are available in all versions of ChatGPT. Um, they are useful, but not, um, not fail proof. So one of the great unknowns is uh, how much, uh, how much weight GPT is applying to everything that you're saying. There's a whole host of research around that. Um, so there's a couple of things that you can try and do in the prompting session. Um, but um, in uh, OpenAI, they give you some best practices. So temperature is one of them. The other thing, if you're leveraging it to, so uh, your example, Terry, um, if you're trying to give it information, actually one of the ways you can give it information is use the text below. To provide me with a summary of the provide me the summary, um, and then it suggests that you should put the text between three quotation marks. Um, that's an input, um, so it differentiates the the actual prompt from the content. Uh, and it's also worth knowing all of these things work. Um, they work on something called tokens, so how much memory it has. So usually providing instructions near the front uh, is helpful and suggested. And if you have a lot of content, so if I place in you know, 300 words of content here, um, I would, may want to do that. Uh, so yeah, I can say use the content above uh, for the summary. So I'm giving it instructions twice. Uh, so there's a number of ways to achieve the same outcome. Um, it depends on how important that is. Uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation. We can come back and answer more questions around prompting and things like that as well, for sure. Um, so a couple of things uh, we went through already. Um, make sure you select your plugins before you start a chat. Um, it's not the end of the world um, if you don't, but just know that you can't add them back in. You just have to need to start a new chat. Second, you can only have three plugins at, the, at a time. Um, if you do have multiple plugins, you should try and provide context if possible. Um, so use the show me plugin, use webpilot and things like that. Um, you can, as we are, uh, as we showed right at the beginning, um, ask ChatGPT, tell me the capabilities of the webpilot plugin um, and it will help you do that. 
um, using plugins will 100% out very kindly by saying may reduce your speed. It will definitely reduce the speed of response that you get. Um, so already if you're using three and out, chat to 3.5 and four, you'll notice there's a massive difference in how quickly they respond. Uh, chat GPT four plus plugins is the slowest way of working. Uh, so just bear that in mind. Uh, and also know that for chat GPT four, which you probably already will, uh, there is currently as of June, 2023, a window of how many, um, how many messages you can submit to chat GPT at a time. And it's 25 at the moment. Uh, that's for chat GPT four. Three and a half, you can go crazy and submit as many messages as you want. All right, uh, we did the demo. Um, before I get into the future, I see there's a question. Uh, would you recommend a plugin to read from spreadsheets? Um, so it depends. Uh, there's a different way to do that, actually. Um, so reading from spreadsheets is going to be difficult uh, at this point. Um, if you want to use plugins to achieve something similar, depend on what your data is uh, available in. Um, so one of the things we can do is so let's try and do that live. Um, give me a sample data set for billing information. So you can ask ChatGPT to give you information. Uh, so it's giving you some information, um, which you can then actually get it to analyze. But my point is, if you have data available um, at the moment, um, there is no good plugin that analyzes spreadsheet information, uh, certainly built into ChatGPT. Um, there is a code interpreter module, uh, which if you have access to it, you will see in the beta features. I do not, so I can't speak to it but that allows you to analyze information much, much quickly. Uh, and with this, I can actually ask it to give, um, to provide me with information. Um, so I can copy that data. Um, so I can go and sort of ask GPT by some um, base data to give me some instructions. Um, right, so it, it can read that it knows what the data is, it can read it and it can figure out um, what things look like and it can give me sort of summaries from that. Um, obviously, all this is made up, uh, but you can see that you can sort of use that to conduct very high level analysis. Um, and for what it's worth, for those of you that are so inclined, you can actually use this information um, to give it output in different formats, um, provide me with. you can ask it for things like that uh, and it will be able to do that as well so you can structure the data for you if you need it to as well cool let me come to your question uh, about um, legal research companies because that is a great question so that does take us very nicely to the future what does the future hold um so they are Two schools of thoughts, according to me, there might be more. Uh, these are my two schools of thoughts. Um, one is um, the plugins as the next app store. And no doubt you will hear about it. Just as when Apple launched the app store way back when, uh, it was a new paradigm of working with different applications. It opened up all sorts of possibilities for third party developers to come in and give you this beautiful, diverse, uh, ecosystem or functionality. That could be where we go. Uh, it could well be where we go. Uh, there's a couple of things missing right now from it. Uh, for one, the ability to browse and select plugins. Uh, two, the ability to get user input and which plugins are good and not. Um, and three, the capabilities of plugins, right? Those things I showed you are useful, but by no means are they the most sophisticated ways of using uh, chat GPT and there's still significantly better um, options available for those that are willing to create the apps uh, that leverage the open AI and other large language models as part of their as part of what they're able to do and that takes us to the second world that is the, the UX paradigm so there is a school of thought that things that people 
people think that there is a world where everyone wants all of their apps in ChatGPT. Of course, there's 100 million users that signed up in the first two months. Why wouldn't you? It's a great business development opportunity. But the reality may be that people want ChatGPT-like functionality from within their app. So think about what Adobe and Canva um, and Figma and many of these apps have done where you can type your questions. You no longer have to use your mouse and keyboard to navigate to the menus and find the answers. You just ask the software that you used to, tell me this information and it magically goes and fetches it for you. So that is a world and it's close. Uh, we're getting there in some way. Um, so that is definitely a paradigm because you think about some of the legal research companies like Lexis and Thomson Reuters, they have both announced and certainly put their foot in the door when it comes to generative AI. Um, Thomson Reuters did a presentation uh, on stage with Microsoft at Microsoft Build, which is a developer conference, showing how they are looking to do some of that work where um, the Thomson Reuters um, functionality becomes available from uh, within the chat window in Word, for example, so you can ask the questions and Lexis are looking to do something similar. So they are responding to it. Um, but I think like most people, they're still working out what do, we pe what do people want? Um, and of course, the biggest thing when it comes to legal research is how can we provide the best answer possible that's accurate? Um, and that's the big challenge for them. So certainly um, they want to release something that's well tested uh, that doesn't have hallucinations because searching may not be as quick sometimes as asking a large language model, but you can read the answers, right? So you want to be able to get citations um, on where are you getting these sources from? Yeah. And by the way, for any of you that are using ChatGPT, you can absolutely ask it to give you citations for anything you ask it. So one of the things I certainly ask for if I'm looking for something a bit more serious than creative, it's say uh, is to ask, you know, give me information about X, Y, and Z. Uh, provide citations and sources where you found the answer, and that's helpful because you can double check where it's getting the answers from before you leverage that information anywhere. And of course, credit the work of the people that have created that content in the first place. Okay. Um, and then the very last point, um, well, the second last point I should say I had um, was around um, one of the future worlds is this sort of world of Microsoft. Um, so if you don't know about Copilot, um, Copilot is something that Microsoft announced. It's essentially leveraging OpenAI within the Microsoft stack. So think of your favorite applications, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and all of those things. Um, and you can just ask it questions. Ask it questions based on your data, your information. So not just generic things on create a chart for me. You can say create a chart for me based on this data set and then ask to manipulate that chart. What if, um, you know, run this sort of complicated Excel analysis um, and create pivot tables, manipulate the what if scenarios on what if the sales decrease over the next month? Um, how does that impact department X um, based on just your data? So Copilot allows you to be able to do that. Um, Microsoft shared this slide as part of the build conference a couple of weeks, months ago now, um, where they suggested the ability to build on top of that with plugins. Uh, so plugins are certainly coming to Bing. Uh, and for anyone who wants to try ChatGPT4 without paying for it, and you won't get plugins yet, but Bing browser allow, and bring the search engine allows you to chat uh, using the large language model uh, and it gives you sources and it's connected to the internet so there are plenty of pluses there um, but with this you can actually enhance the possibilities of copilot with plugins so that could certainly make uh, open up the ecosystem and this is one of the ways where tr certainly demonstrated how their plugin might work from within copilot um, so there's, I'm sure, a YouTube video about that somewhere on the internet. Uh, it's worth checking out if you're interested. And uh, Lexis will likely be looking to do something similar as well. And then lastly, I'll leave you with this and happy to answer any questions that people have. Um, 
really the future is going to be about more than just plugins. It's going to be about the questions that you can ask. Um, so at the moment, we're in this world where you need to know the information. Yes, you can search for an internet, um, but searching is painful. It requires effort. Um, as the large language models continue to become more sophisticated, which they will, uh, you'll hear about something called multimodality, which is the ability to not just feed it text, but also videos and audio and more. When that becomes introduced. You have more fine-tuned models, so specific, let's say, to legal. Um, and there are no token limits. Uh, so you can ask uh, it to analyze really large pieces of text really easily. And there's a couple of models out there already that have this ability. Then it's about how can you give um, how can you give the best questions in the right way to get the answer that you want. Um, and with that, let me see. Uh, do you think open source large language models will ever surpass proprietary large language models like OpenAI's ChatGPT? Um, maybe. Uh, so the the open source large language model ecosystem is absolutely thriving. Um, I'm not sure if it will surpass it or not. Uh, it depends. Um, I think general purpose ones, possibly. Um, there is certainly, and I read uh, and hear about a new research paper and a bit of work that's done every week uh, that helps it uh, influence it more. But it's going to be about how quickly can you improve these things, right? So um, the open source ecosystem behind large language models is diverse and thriving and people want to do a lot. Uh, and they're making all of the uh, all of the behind the behind the scenes thing known to everyone. So yeah, I think it will become it will be competitive. I'm not sure if it will which will win, um, and it depends on what winning is. To be honest, because there's still unknowns about certainly to me. You know, OpenAI could become a back end company like uh, Amazon's AWS, which just provides you with API access, or it can go all in. Uh, on the front end uh, of things like ChatGPT, or you can continue doing what it's doing now as a hybrid. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of different ways these things can go. So uh, I wish I knew the answer. I, but I was just thinking about that in terms of, um, you know, how things might change from a law, let's say, a law firm perspective. And particularly if they are able to kind of work increasingly with their own data. That the differentiator mm -hmm. is going to increasingly like at the at the moment it, it's kind of focused around speed in a way mm -hmm. being able to access things quickly but that it would also incorporate quality of the actual product that you can access as well so i just wanted to get your thoughts on where where do you see that differentiator lying because everybody's mm -hmm. going to have access to this in some respect so it's going to it's yeah. going to come down with what are they pulling things out of? How quickly, how effectively do they use that internally? So I want to get your thoughts, if I may, a little bit on that. Yeah, um, I had a conversation two weeks ago with a general counsel for um, a large company and um, there, one of the executives were speaking to them and they, they came to them and said, we're starting to use chat GPT specifically in many areas of the business of the corporation um which is not novel and the thing that stood out was the statement they made in the past you had to choose between better faster cheaper right and you choose, you pick two out of the three with tools like this you can have things that are better faster and cheaper uh, and by the way the cost of training these models is only going down further and further um, i wish i had the study to hand um, but it was something like if the projected training cost curve continues, um, by the time we get to, I think it was 2032, it would take approximately 65 US dollars to train a model the size of ChatGPT, uh, which is insane. Uh, so if you think about that, and how technology will evolve. So where you can use this. Um, yeah, absolutely. The quality of information will matter. Right? It's the same thing as you think about internet and data. There is a ton of resources available and 
you know, lawyers are trained at certainly at the base level on, on the core uh, facets of law, right? If you go to the College of Law, you uh, two people walk out, they both have the same degree, they both have the same level of information. Um, so that will be helpful um, for individuals. Yeah, sure. But it's what you do with that information. How do you analyze that information? And I think there's two different ways, um, and this might be a little bit sad, but I'm going to share it anyway. Uh, I often use ChatGPT as my, my sort of analyst second brain. If I'm pondering how to solve a question, um, this is a place I go to, um, and I use it to ask me questions. I think that's the value in some ways. Uh, over time, as you get to law firms and they have their own proprietary data set, think of the questions they can ask. Right, a firm that's been around for or works and specializes in M and A. Um, imagine you can just, you know, query the the collective knowledge and wisdom of that firm as a junior associate to say, hey, I'm speaking to a client who's looking to do X, Y, and Z transaction. Um, if you were in my position, what questions would you ask? Um, what are some of the blind spots that I don't see? And you turn, when you ask for blind spots, turn that temperature way off the gauge, right? You want the most creative, crazy out there ideas that you may not think of yourself. So yeah, I think those, those, those things will potentially matter. Um, but in the, the question initially is, you know, how can we feed it the information and be confident that doesn't go to everyone, right? So there's that proprietary information debate that happens a lot. Yeah, and, and I imagine that, you know, where it probably will settle will be that combination, um, obviously within a safe environment, and I underscore that a thousand times, um, of that combination of your um, own intellectual property plus what you may buy in. And so you've yeah. kind of got the best of both worlds. But, you know, going, going to your point as well, um, Ab, I was just thinking how differently that is going to change how we work and how differently yeah. that will change, for example, how you uh, teach and people learn in terms yeah. of, you know, exactly to your point in terms of how they, how they do the job um, or how anyone does the job for that matter. Um, I know yeah. that we're getting very, very close to time, so I just wanted to do a quick call out to anyone who might have a last question. Um, but why I am doing that, I, I do want to remind people um, again that AB is available to find in a lot of different places on social media, but certainly on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Um, I would strongly recommend to you that you do subscribe um, for all of AB's newsletters. There's a relatively new one, the Law Tech Daily, but you put out a newsletter that is that is quite far reaching. And there was a fabulous one that you've just done really focused on plugins. So if you want to go back to a text version to have a kind of look through various things, that's there as well. And we'll put that resource with this recording, add that link so people can yeah. kind of go to that and find that as well. Um, yeah. As far as the centre is concerned, please do follow us on LinkedIn and a bunch of other social media as well. But I wanted to draw two additional things to your attention. There is a LinkedIn public group called Legal Generative AI. We have almost a thousand members in that group now after just weeks of operation. These are the sort of things that we share on that. So please uh, do connect with us there or connect with us also on our Generative AI initiative, which has kind of a, a multi-pronged um, aspect to that as well. So with that having been said, Ab, I just need to thank you once again for an amazing presentation. Really, really appreciate your time, especially in the afternoon um, and you're overseas um, and just lovely to see you again. Thank you so much. Likewise, thank you for having me. And if anyone has any questions, please reach out. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. Just a reminder that our next session is going to be on large language models. So this AI in legal series is following a format to really provide foundational information in all of these things. And I'm sure that presentation will continue to be as wonderful as this one has been. Thanks again, Ab. Thanks everyone for attending. Bye. Thanks. Bye.